mighty hour promises to gather everyone he scattered. And I am a Hebrew. We are Hebrews. I was born in Texas. I am a Hebrew and I am from Florida. I'm a Hebrew and I was born in California. I am a Hebrew and I was born in San Diego, California. I'm a Hebrew. I was born in Indiana. I am a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I am a Hebrew and I was born in Spain. I am a Hebrew from West Africa, Liberia. I am a Hebrew, and I was born in Straight Lane. We are Hebrews. Oh, my sister. Shalom and greetings. I'm Sister Ashley. I greet you with Deuteronomy 10, 12, and now, Israel, what does Yahweh, the Lord that God, require of you but to fear him, walk in his ways, love him, and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Bless you, each of you. Thank you for your time your patience with us, your uh, your honor that you would give us, hallelujah, to tune in tonight and to listen. I'm your host, as I said, Sister Ashley. I fear him. I'm a bought and paid for possession of Jesus Christ, and I'm glad to be before you. Hallelujah. I always try to have someone with me, and tonight I have my co-host, my faithful co-host, Mother Jennifer, your mother, Israel. Mother Jennifer, give us a sound check. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom, daughters of Zion. Blessings to all of you and blessings to you, Sister Ashley. Um, Thank you for having me on. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, I pray that everyone is is doing well, everyone's encouraged, and everyone is ready for the upcoming Feast of Yah. Um, It looks like, well, we're waiting on a sound check to uh, come into the chat room, and I don't see it yet. Oh, we got a 10. So looks like we're good to, to go ahead, Sister Ashley. 
Hallelujah. Can you please start tonight with your acknowledgments and the things on your heart? Yes. I first and uh, foremost want to acknowledge the Most High Yah for his patience, his love, and his long suffering toward us. Um, I don't think we really truly understand the long suffering that he has truly extended toward us. And you'll understand it when you start um, asking the Father to help you to love your sisters even more. And he'll start showing you the long suffering that he has given you, and you'll start operating um, out of that same long suffering. So I'm thankful for the long suffering that he has shown towards me, his loving kindness, his compassion, and the fact that he never will break covenant with us at all. I'm so thankful for his steadfast love and just for his correction and for his rebuke that we're not bastards. We belong to him. We are his possession. I want to acknowledge my head, Elder Rufus, for um, being such a sound presence in my life, for the example that he sets in his relationship, his marriage with the Most High Yah, always being able to look to him for solid instruction, solid wisdom, solid discernment, never wavering at all. Um, It's an honor for me to be able to have a, a head who shows his love toward the Most High Yah in action, not just using words, but in action. And finally, I want to acknowledge our shepherd, Pastor Dow, for um, teaching us the, the quote-unquote tough things that we are not taught um, in the world, you know, that Christianity or other religions will never, ever teach you. Um, such a great teaching this past Shabbat, and it still is resonating really deep within my heart um, how, you know, we don't belong to ourselves and how selfish we can be as people and how our temple does not belong to us. It actually belongs to him. So I, I just want to acknowledge him for really giving us something to um, to not only think on, but to put into action and to do because he puts it into action. So blessings to you, Pastor Dow, and to your entire family. And that's all I have, Sister Ashley. Hallelujah. I, too, glorify our Abba, our Creator, our Most High. Mother Jennifer, I love knowing the Most High's sovereignty, um, glorifying Him for being higher than my thoughts. I love waiting for Him. I love resting in Him. I love not knowing all the answers. Um, I love His ways. I really do. I love His people with all my heart, and He knows it. Um I'm very thankful for um, his very detailed instruction into the ears of our shepherd. I've meticulously watched our shepherd for years because I fear for my soul, not because of man worship, as we are often accused, but I'm running for my life, as some of you are. And I've been with Shepherd for years. I've been uh, close to him, far away from him, meaning in distance or moved away from him, married, um, been long periods of time not seeing him, not hearing from him, but yet observing his um, him, his family, his preaching. I'm a witness to the life he lives and to his obedience to our Creator, his long suffering and his patience and spirit. I I often will reap these accolades on the show because I'm forever grateful and indebted to this man who has allowed me onto this land. Um, It's not for uh, vainglory. It's not for any other reason. And to the detail of his obedience, Mother Jennifer, he is, um, you know, I've watched his timing throughout the years, you know, from the timing when he says, let's build a pavilion to the timing of let's build a children's playground. And what I mean by timing is, you know, you're initiating a project, you're initiating direction, and you're allow- and people are following and maneuvering according to what you're hearing that doesn't generate from you, and things fall into place, you know, from the building of our first guest home. And we had just finished it when Elder Rufus and um, used to be sister Mother Jennifer arrived. It was just finished, um, and we began to get guests after that. 
Um, you know, the food stocks, the food preparation, the silver purchases, everything is very meticulous, it's detailed because the father loves his people. And a gift is to represent, you know, the gift of a pastor, the gift of a shepherd is to represent the most high's love to his people. Um, you know, every message, you know, traveling to every state, meeting, um, all the meetings out through the years and the, and the conferences, everything, you know, just being very detailed from the shortwave radio to what is now the Internet and global, um, you know, down to, you know, he's called into this show before. He's had me read emails before. Everything is, you know, just really detailed, very led by the Father. And um, thank you, I, I thank him, I thank the Father for him, you know, that he, Pastor goes to Dry Bones Conference, right? And you're going to hear about it as as we go forward because it was just a mighty move. It's not tonight's topic, but it was just a mighty move. And, you know, he calls into the show, our show, and listens in, you know, even when he's away, away from this land, away from the, the sheep here, just to call in to, you know, give some um, directions to those who are needing healing just for hours later. Those that listened and obeyed and hearkened, they received their healing, you know, down to um, his work. You know, when I moved here at 27 years old, um, yes, of course, everyone who comes here has their own spirit and their own work abilities and their own nature and discipline, um, but he really cultivated and um, initiated a lot of growth in me as well as hundreds and hundreds of people. It's just I'm the one talking tonight, but, you know, from the work that he does to the discipline that he has, um, all the hours, pardon me, I need to turn that off, forgive me, saints, all the, the discipline and the time that, um, you know, being on time, keeping your word commitments when you, when you say you're going to do something, all that's been taught by him, hours and hours of endless preaching. And you've heard me say before, in the days when you were not even in our minds, none of you, we did not know you by name or by state. And Pastor would say, the time will come when I won't see you every day. I will not be pouring into any of you anymore, you know, or it will be poured in differently as you see now. But just his generosity, his patience, his patience and spirit, all of that you can glean from. So I'm running for my life, for my life as hard as I can every day with fear and to be able to have people like him, his family, uh, the women in his life, um, the saints on the land, et cetera, some of you who love the Father, knowing you, I thank the Father for it. I know that's a long acknowledgement, but it really just, it's, it's a picture for me. It's a really just something that I set before my face and before my eyes and I run hard for it. I love those in my life that provoke me to righteousness like my head, my head, uh, Deacon Bell, a very mature man. Um, there's no vanity in him, Mother Jennifer. He's a man of few words. He's never cared about what others think. And that early years, early years, um, was very pivotal in my life because I cared a lot. I cared a lot. I was very bound by the fear of man. And, you know, really joining yourself to a man that is completely opposite gives you so much freedom. You know, you can't say that you got that freedom or attained it on your own or because of you, you know. Um, he's a steady hand. Deacon Bell is a very steady hand and a gentle God in my life. He's not wavering in any kind of behavior ever. You know, he's not wavering in his covenant with me. He's always joyful. He's a great father. He's got sound answers for his children. He's definitely not deceived by the heart of, of his own sons, but still steady and loving. And I follow him willingly. I follow my husband uh, willingly with great fear. I fear the most high, or I could follow no man. Um, but, you know, I want to thank uh, the Father also for Mother Carol, Mother Jennifer, those that are uh, women before us for their examples. Every one of you who are on your knees, who are supporting by prayer, um, running your, you know, running with fear and fasting, knowing that it's not um, the Father who needs your fast, it's you that needs your fast. You know, I'm um, just really, really, really thankful tonight. I'm always thankful. I'm thankful to, to wait on Yah for all things. I'm thankful to be at the place that I'm at in my mind and in my walk with the Father, uh, needing approval of no man and just full of joy, you know, really am. Uh, despite any trial, despite any anything that comes my way, I'm just 
I'm with a steady man, and I, I pray to always represent his steady house. But uh, welcome again live to the show. We have 28 days until the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, greetings to any and all beloved Florida saints that are listening tonight. Thank you once again, Texas and Florida, for everything you've done, for the dry bones, for our shepherd, and to our shepherd's beloved family. Bless you and any uh, any support you give our shepherd, any obedience you give him, everything that you do for him, I thank you. For his, it is for all of Israel to make his life um, better, smoother, more joyful, to support him, to lift his hands up. Uh, thank you for doing that behind the scenes. So, hallelujah, Mother Jennifer. It's Q&A tonight, huh? Question and answer. You said you got some questions, and hopefully we have some answers. Um, we hope to have a great conversation and dialogue every every fifth day. We hope that you come wanting to learn and and wanting to hear how to be a help meet. That's really our goal um, to present a mirror before you so that you can see yourself by the trials and experiences that we've had, so that we can run this race together. Hallelujah, Mother Jennifer. Any any thoughts? Uh, what about any announcements? Sister Ashley, I just want to make um, one more acknowledgement. I just want to acknowledge um, my beloved sisters from Straightway, Florida. Uh, they are here with us um, visiting. And so we have Brother Michael Israel and um, Sister Koya and all of the, well, most of the Straightway, Florida saints here. So we've got a total of about 30 saints that will be here with us. And I told Sister Ashley earlier, I said, you know, it looks like a mini tabernacle. you got tents on the land and the spirit on the land is so beautiful. Um, the love between the sisters is so beautiful. There's no contention in the air at all. Uh, it's just a really nice, loving environment. They got here early this morning and they were super excited and super ready to work. Um, they didn't want to rest. They drove all night, did not want to rest at all. They were just ready to to jump in and do what needed to be done. So I'm so excited to have them here, and I just look forward to um, just being able to fellowship with them even more. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. I am um, blessed to always hear very good reports of, of you, uh, Florida sisters. Um, I encourage you all not to be afraid to fall, not to be afraid to mess up or to see one another as who you really are and really grow together. Um, we just, we're just we going to the kingdom, you know. I have a quote and a picture years ago. As I said earlier, I guess it's, it's throwback fifth day, huh? But years ago, as this comes to my mind, I was walking down the, we call it down the hill, because our tabernacle is at the top of a steep hill, and we go down the hill together because we also own the bottom property. I was walking with uh, Shepherd and uh, his family. He, this is literally years ago, probably before I was married, maybe 10 years ago. And uh, I just so happened to take a really good picture of him walking down the hill in front of me. I think my picture was supposed to be, uh, you know, it was of the of the wilderness, the beauty of the fall season, but he happened to be in it. And that particular Shabbat, he had made a statement. I just found the, the quote and the picture this week going through some uh, scrapbooks. And uh, those that are with me now and going into tribulation with me will see Yah and all his glory. And so it was a beautiful promise, and I wrote it down anyway. It's in my scrapbook. But uh, to those of you who support him, thank you. Thank you very much. I believe it to this day. If you support him, you follow him 100%. You believe what he says, and you believe the Bible. It's about the word, the word that is living, regardless of what's on the pages, but the word that's living in our hearts. Um, thank you. That's all I can say is thank you. Thank you for your support to him uh, so that we may all grow together in this unified body. Thank you again, Florida. All right, so... Uh, Question and answer. We've been getting some compliments on just kind of uh, freestyling our shows and, you know, uh, emails, phone calls, I'm sure. And I hope that each of you, um, as you strive for holiness, that you would always have questions. Uh, and, and you know, as we've always said, Mother Jennifer's always said, if we don't have an answer for you, we will get you to the person that has an answer. I have never come across a um I've never come across a question that wasn't answered by this ministry. I don't think you could even create one. Um, you know, sometimes when you're taking phone calls and you see, um, you not see, you hear the weighty matters, 
that have to be passed up the, the chain, you know. And it's not from those that are calling that are just hashing out all their business. It's not. When they call with integrity and they actually just say, you know, I need to speak to a brother or elder or pastor about this, you know, and you're just, just taking a note. Usually when I take phone calls, I'll always ask, what note can I leave him? Uh, you know, when, when someone says they just want to talk to pastor, I want to get a little more information, right? And um, some of the matters, you know, are really, really heavy like I definitely and we as women would never have the answers or you know give direction in those matters and those are the things that are taking place behind the scenes you know to to our leaders and so we support you we do and I me on behalf of the women in this room behind me I have quite a few handful and those that are listening we support you all elders and leadership for the things you handle that no man sees but y'all hallelujah mother Jennifer anything else I think we're good. Oh, don't forget to check out the Be a Blessing list on YouTube, Straightway Help Me. Please check out the Be a Blessing list so that you can determine what you need to bring for the feast and contact Straightway, letting them know what you plan to bring so that they can keep an accurate count of what they have coming and what they still have need of. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. Thank you for bringing that up. October the 5th, y'all willing, if it doesn't change, Mother Carol being in charge of the store date hours, uh, of course, getting permission from our shepherd, and having the store in the dining hall is October 5th, if it doesn't change. That's a, a Monday. Um, we call second day, or I'm sorry, we call Jesus. Yeah, second day. Father, I'm teaching Hebrew months and Greek months and... Y'all gotta, y'all gotta help me. I step out of, I step out of homeschool and go. What's Monday? Oh, Father, gotta teach the lie sometimes. Uh, so October fifth, second day, and um, what else? So we got the, we got the store. I've taken, uh, I have at least six of you written down. I announced last week. Please call in if you plan on or desire a table for what you would like to sell. Um, all I do is take the note and pass it right up the chain to Mother Carol. Spare her all the phone calls and the text messages. Please send them through me or just whoever answers in the – in the. it doesn't even have to be me. Just whoever answers. Just write down, you know, for, for Mother um, or for Ashley because I have a running total of six people, and I'll just give them right to her. Um, yes, there's – body products and hair products and tinctures and, and some really awesome things, natural products that I think if it's your first time coming, you'll really enjoy seeing. Um, yes, there's garments and T-shirts and a seamstress that comes and she can measure you and make you uh, whatever you desire. Um, oh, man, I have to take a moment, Mother Jennifer. This is this is just my, my heart for a moment. My daughter, y'all know I have three sons, right? My daughter, Judith Baja, um, is having a table this year, and I'm really, really excited. Sister uh, Angelica did not ask me to announce this, nor did Brother Scott. This is something Ashley's doing. Um, J- Judith came and asked for, you know, permission for a table, and it's so – you guys got to bring your quarters. You got to bring your quarters. She's uh, she's She draws targets for her dad, and she's selling targets to you. And she had also told me, elders will not have to pay – and she said that, you know, she wasn't getting she wasn't getting direction from anybody behind the scenes, like elders aren't gonna pay. But she she had the heart for it. So please bring a quarter, buy a target, um, see what else she may have at her table for some change. I don't think anything will be over a dollar, we'll see. I'll update you, but I'm excited about her her growing investment table. Um, she's my little my little second grader. So, um, all right, here we go. Bless you, sister Bonnie. Mama Deidre, Sister D, everyone listening in the chat room, great is your faithfulness. Thank you. Brother Ugly, I see you. Hallelujah. I could go down through all of them. I won't. Mother Jennifer, kick off the show with a question. Uh, if we don't have many emails or whatever whatever you got for us tonight, then maybe I can open up the, the guest call in. So let me know what you got. I'm ready. All right. I got some emails. I'm going to go ahead and read. Um The sister says, Shalom, I am from uh, Pennsylvania, and I've been in the ministry for a while now. I've had two of my master's children, and the first one I did not have at home, nor did I follow the purification process. I just had a girl. She's going on one month, and I had her at home. Such an amazing experience that was. All praises to the Most High Yah. This will be my first time doing purification. 
I just wanted to know the do's and don'ts of the purification process. I want to make sure what I do is right. I know I'm not supposed to fellowship with the saints and men shouldn't see me for 80 days. Is there anything else to be added to that? Shalom and blessings. I pray someone can answer my question. Sister Ashley. Hallelujah. So I'm pulling up really quick the the scripture. And let's go to Leviticus 12. Let's see. All right. Yah spoke unto Moshe, saying, speaking to the children of Israel, say, if a woman have conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation we call purification. All right. So the separation... If you uh, look behind it, it, it means set apart, unclean, removed, filthy, impure, and rejected. Okay? So you are, yes, set apart. Um, for her, it, it says infirmity. Infirmity as if, um, it's, she, as if it's a sickness, though you're not. Your body is still cleansing and purging. There's a very interesting cleansing dynamic that is going on internally inside of you to cleanse cellular waste. So it really is as if it's a sickness or disease. Don't get my words messed up. I'm not saying there's something wrong with you. It really is a time of set-apartness. So you are abstaining from sexual relations for sure. And going on down to verse 5, if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean. Uh, two weeks, as in her separation, then she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. The time goes uh, longer. It's more extended, okay? What is it, 80 to 82 days for a girl, I think, 41 for a boy, something like that, if you do your math according to Leviticus 12. So, no, you do not go um, before the people. You did not go, even then, you didn't go into the tabernacle, into the assembly, it says. But, it really is what your husband wants you to do. This is a prime example of how we teach women when you don't have an answer. Good question, by the way. When you don't have an answer, you put the question onto your husband to let him give you direction. Um, sometimes women wait for their husband to give them direction and they function outside of uh, communication. So if you take this question, and maybe you have, I'm just speaking in general, you take this question and you ask him his expectations and see how the conversation goes and rest in that, rest in that. Um, can you add to that, Mother Jennifer, because that's really the basis of how it starts. Uh, you're, not, you're not going into assembly, you're not gathering or meeting, you're not going to the grocery store unless, I mean, if he makes you, that's a, that's a him thing. I don't go to the grocery store. I don't leave the land. I don't even leave the land when I'm not in purification. But if you're, pure and you're pouring your soul into this child as you should and really bonding with this child, you don't have any desires to leave anyway. It's just a set-apart time that you're inside your house with you and this child, your husband's seed. Mother? I think you answered it very well, um, Sister Ashley. You know, we need to remember that it's your time to really bond with that child, to really learn that child, and to really learn how to be a mother. Um, I find that each experience can be different when you're dealing with children. You may have thought that you, you knew something, you know, with the last pregnancy or the last birth that you had, and then you learned something completely um, all over again as far as when it comes to, to motherhood. So it is your time to be able to really bond with that child. So um, I think you gave really good sound advice, Sister Ashley. I don't have anything else to add. Hallelujah. When the days of your purifying are filled, as the word says, purifying means brightness, clearness, and glory. So at the end, there's a brightness. It's over. Purification's over. Off to a, a, a new start, a new life. And uh, it's full of uh, learning, you know, learning how what your child needs when it cries, learning why it's crying or not, learning the sounds it makes and what the sounds mean, you know, and it's a continual bond. Uh, it's going to be very, very different from your first child, very, very different uh, from the hormones that are released in, while you're breastfeeding or nursing. The connection is really out of this world. You know, as your child ages, you know exactly Every pattern of behavior that they learned, you know where it came from. 
if you're paying attention. Every pattern, every tone of voice, every attitude, everything from whether it's you, your husband, uh, the children around it, whatever. You don't protect your child from the sin and iniquity that was born in. You just teach them how to deny evil and walk in good. Right? You're just a teacher, a teacher, a teacher. We live in a generation that really wants to exalt each child. We said this before on the show as a, a god. You know, you haven't experienced this sort of love before. Now you have it, and you want everybody's world to evolve around it. And it's not so here. We we live very tribally, you know, very we're one big, huge family, no man greater than, than the other, all, you know, all things in common. Uh, so a child, though it's a beautiful and wonderful thing, very delicate and precious thing, it's, um, you know, I, what, what do I say, Mother Jennifer? You live tribally. Absolutely. You know, it, the beauty of it is that um, when you're in purification um, as a community, as a, as a tribe, um, that is the time when you really see the love of your sisters. You know, you're going to have a sister that is going to really want to help you along, help you with your chores, help you with whatever you need so that you can truly fulfill the purification, um, you know, the purification time that's required of you so that you can truly focus on what you need to, learning the baby, learning your child, learning, um, you know, what your your husband requires of you as a mother. And so I think the beauty really comes in when it comes to the relationship of the sisters, how the sisters really come together during that time. I believe it's a beautiful thing. I've experienced it um, before, and, you know, we've been able to, to really flow in that here um, in Georgia, and I, I, I really see the beauty in it. Sister Ashley? Yes, I agree. Hallelujah, I agree. Um, my children reap the benefits of the family that surrounds them, and you have the heart, I have the heart, my husband's heart, that desires others to um, get the opportunity to know them, love them, correct them, um, you know, be an uncle to them, be a brother to them. Uh, so let your child learn his family, his or her family. Hallelujah. Move on. Next question. Okay, next question. If it is allowed, how do you go to your sister to correct her disrespectful behavior towards her master or should you keep quiet? Sister Ashley. All right. If it's allowed. Interesting. I leave a man's house alone. That's what I do. Mother Jennifer. <laughs> Sister Ashley, I have um I have experienced disrespect before, disrespectful behavior towards um a, a man from his ashaya and it has been in the open in front of other women and in that moment i will say something to that sister when her when her master leaves if he leaves the room i will say something to her and i will say we don't speak to our masters like that we don't speak to our husbands like that and i do that because we live together under one roof and you have to make sure that you're correcting behaviors and that things are not um, – because you don't want the younger women thinking that, you know, this behavior is okay, that it is allowed. So if these things are done in the open, then I will say something in the open. Um, I don't go beyond that. I don't go past that. But I will point out that it is inappropriate. Um, to that particular sister that has spoken inappropriately to her master. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. So I'll cover the other side of that because I, I wholeheartedly agree and I appreciate um, the times where things are engaged, you know, because it is obvious. It is noticed. So it is right, as Mother Jennifer said. Um, but if, depending on your mind as a woman, if we clear you to go to someone, you notice someone's flesh, and then you go to them in your flesh, and then you go to them in your flesh because Jennifer does it, 
or Ashley said it. We got to be balanced. Proverbs says, reprove not a scorner, lest he hates you. But the reproof towards a scorner that would make him hate you is to make mouths at him, to mock him, you know. I'm not saying the reproof part. I'm saying the scorning part. The scorner is to make mouth at. If you can't handle someone, if you already despise their nature, you already have an offense, you already have an evil eye, and you're seeing their open behavior in the open, you're not the one to be used. Mother Jennifer's going in maturity and in character, in love to gain. See the difference? And if you have that same intention, then go for it. Because we are to love one another and help one another. So you see you see them in a fault, pull them out of the fire. You know, hey, this happened, this is in the open. You know, as you say, you pull them to the side. You don't um, turn it into a flesh debate. And so you really have to um, sit back and assess for a moment before you say anything. And you always go to entreat, right? So depending on the relationship that you and that sister has, and the offense that you have or you think she has, you could create an issue that's greater that you don't even want to battle or fight with for the next two weeks because you're not mentally strong enough to hold it. Okay? So, I'll leave you, Mother Jennifer. Anything else? I wanted to say, you know, when you're in situations like this, I always think about um, James 3.17, where it says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then peaceable, gentle, and it's easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So if I know that my heart is pure, then you know that um, you're going to come from a, a, a great place of wisdom. You know that it, it is the wisdom from Yah if it's pure in your heart, if your motive is pure. But like Ashley said, if, if you're in the flesh, and you're trying to satisfy something that you're feeling in your flesh because of something that you see in another sister, then that's not the wisdom from above. So you have to make sure that your intent and your purpose and your motive is first pure. Sister Ashley. Very good. Proverbs says you rebuke a wise man and he will love you. He will love you. Um. It brings to mind, I think I think we brought this up, uh, it's coming up often actually, uh, last week with Paul. When you do wrong, you take it patiently because you messed up, right? You're supposed to take it patiently because you messed up. We're in such a very arrogant and cold generation that you mess up and you won't even take it patiently when someone approaches you. But as Paul says, you t- if you if you had a wrong you take it patiently. You messed up. It is what it is. You go on. But Paul also says when you do right and you get corrected and you take it patiently, you buff it for your faults, then this is godliness. So if we actually had the mature and humble nature of our Messiah as women, then we wouldn't be offended when someone approaches us. We wouldn't be offended when... We see something wrong. You rebuke a wise man, he'll love you. You wouldn't fear going to one another. So that's the goal we're striving to get to, that nature. Hallelujah. Because things are, he brought us together to get us into one mind, one heart, and to get us into his kingdom. If you understand his motive, all mistakes are to get you further. All falls are to get you to get up. I mean, Hallelujah. Right, Mother Jennifer? Absolutely. Hallelujah. Yes, very well said. I have nothing to add. Next question. Next question. Is it acceptable for a husband to take on another wife if the husband is not taking care of the wife he already has spiritually? I want to, if I may, Sister Ashley, I, I wanted to comment on this. And I want to talk about the ministry that we're in and um, the leadership that we have and how they operate in such high integrity and righteousness. You know, there are, um, there are rules 
And there are things that are put in place to protect the women in this ministry. There are things that are in place to protect the men in this ministry. Um, when a man is desiring to take on another Ashaya, it, it goes through the leadership of the ministry. It's not as if um, the man is at liberty to just go out and do as he pleases and just come home and, and tell his wife, well, I, I took another woman. That's not how it works in this ministry. We have very, very wise leaders who um, understand polygyny in and out. They understand marriage. They understand um, relationships. And so they are the ones who will um, determine if this man is ready to take on another wife, if he is ready to spiritually support um, another woman or not. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I think that women can come from the standpoint of fear, uh, fearing that they are going to lose the time that they have with their man, with, with the husband. And so from that, they're going to make up excuses. Well, I'm not being led properly. I'm not being poured into spiritually. You know, all these things come up out of fear. So this is why these things go through the leadership, and the leadership will determine um, if this man is able to take on another woman. Um, Sister Ashley, does that make sense? It does. Uh, um, I want this sister to understand that her perception of her husband isn't the deciding factor for whether he's ready for anything in his life. So I warn you not to be out of your role, you know, as you assume what he may or may not be ready for. Um, you face your fears. You face your accusations towards him, your bitterness in your heart towards him, the rejections you feel and all the feelings that are flooding you with the very thought of this happening to him. You deal with yourself, Mother Jennifer. Absolutely. I think, you know, Sister Ashley, and we get a lot of questions, and most of the questions are answered by, um, you know, the answer is you deal with yourself. Deal with yourself first. Don't accuse anybody else. And I even bring up, you know, what you, what you tend to say a lot, you know, you're always wrong, even if you're right. You still had a part in that that was wrong, that needs to be corrected, and you need to figure out what that is. But when you jump the gun and you say, you know, well, he did, he did, or he is not, then you're coming from an accusing standpoint, and the father can't even protect you in that at all. But if you really sincerely go to him and you're looking at yourself and you're not accusing, that is when he can really fight on your behalf. He can really be an advocate for you, but we're so used to fighting on our own and fighting um, because we think that we're being defrauded. We think that we're being wronged in some kind of way. And so you've already shown the Father that, that you don't need him at all. So we lack humility. We truly lack humility in our responses to, you know, what we think, and we're, we tend to come from an accusatory standpoint um, a lot. Sister Ashley? Yes, ma'am. Will you um, read that question one more time for a different example? Yes. Is it acceptable for a husband to take on another wife if the husband is not taking care of the wife he already has spiritually? All right. Is it acceptable? Stop. When you ask questions um, to anyone, you first ponder them in your own heart. This is where wise counsel will come in so handy. If I'm going to a counselor or anyone, I ponder my own heart's questions for this reason. What do I want to hear? Question mark. Okay, what do I want to hear? Deal with that. Is it acceptable... That's what you're asking. Is it acceptable? It could be it could be anything. Each of you that are listening tonight, maybe you have a question. Is it acceptable that I do this? Is it acceptable that she does that? Is it okay 
if I correct, a woman who disrespected her husband in the open, right? Is it okay? Is it okay with who? That's that's what you ask yourself. Is it okay with me? Are you saying Ashley, Jennifer, the ministry, or you? Are you really asking because you're saying, is it acceptable that my husband take on another woman when he's not taking care of me? But I reword it, you know, to get your wisdom, to see what the ministry thinks, so that then I can decide what I want to think. We do that. And based on, and, and I know that as a host of a show, believe me, I know it. So based on my answer, right, as I try to give, uh, you know, the righteous always hear and fear. They always apply. We're, we're only um, re-verbalizing everything we've heard from our teachers, our husbands. Um, so I just share that with you. You ask yourself that own qu- your own question. Is it acceptable to you? Is it acceptable to the ministry? Who are you wanting to hear from to validate? Right? And you and you search your heart even further. But that's all on that, Mother Jennifer. Next question. All right, next question. How do I accept my master desiring a polygynous marriage? And is it wrong if I disagree and decide to separate if he takes on multiple wives? Um, Go ahead, Mother Sister Ashley, if if I can, um, you know, how do I accept my master desiring a polygynous marriage? First of all, you have to realize that he does not belong to you, that you belong to him, that you are his possession, and you desire what he desires. You don't have your own desires anymore. So when you are um, when you are this man's possession, you realize that whatever his his desires are, whatever his dreams are, then you are his help meet. And so you are there to help him meet those desires, those goals, those dreams. Um, he doesn't belong to you. And that is the main point, I think, in all of this. So how do I accept my master desiring a polygynous marriage? First of all, realize that he is not yours. He is not your possession. Um, and is it wrong if I disagree and decide to separate if he takes on multiple wives. So if this man is capable of taking on another woman and you decide to um, to leave because you don't agree, um, yes, yes, you are wrong. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. Well said. Um, you know, uh, your acceptance is... You know, I want to I want to stay here for a minute, Mother Jennifer, and obviously um, through your experience and who you speak to, I want to hear hear more because not accepting it, which is where you're at right now, you have to count the cost of that. You have to count the cost of that decision, and it's far more weighty than you understand because when divorce is an option to our culture that we live in, or I'm saying America, forgive me, when divorce is an option in America, then you can accept or deny anything. But when you commit yourself unto the creator and his polygynous marriage to his brides, to his people, his thoughts, his ways, this faith, you're denying a lot more than you would understand by not accepting it. So it's a very fearful place for you to be in. It's a place where the enemy is able to minister all the rejections and the hurts to you. It can cause many things to happen in your body. It can take your breath away and give you panic attacks. And I, and, and this is through experience just hearing, um, you know, from different sisters as they've had to overcome or accept. Okay? So it's not about, uh, well, you know, you're just, you're just so wicked for not accepting it, no, we're saying to accept it is to accept your creator and to deny yourself. So the heart palpitations and losing your breath and your panic attacks and your anger and your mind and the torment that says, I can't do this and I can't live this and I can't see it and it hurts too bad and all all those things, that is a perfect place for you to be in total surrender to the Most High. 
for him to take you to a place in your mind that you never knew existed, a place that is accepted by him, because where you're at in your mind is not being accepted by him, which is why you don't have a peaceable fruit of righteousness, which is why you don't have peace that passes all understanding in your mind. So the fruit of your own thoughts is proving you're denying what's set before you. And it hurts you that you have nowhere else to go. It hurts you you have nowhere to go to, and you confess those things. Because if you had somewhere else to go, you would have already went. And now you're between a rock and a hard place trying to make a decision, asking for permission to deny the way of our people. And we can't support that. Mother Jennifer? You know, Sister Ashley, the Most High has many wives, um, including you. And when you reject his wives, when you reject, um, you know, his ways, then you are rejecting him. And it's going to restrict you from fully loving your sisters. And I'm, I'm even speaking about if, um, if you have a, um, a family that is not polygynous, but if you are still not accepting of polygyny, then it's really going to restrict you from fully loving your sisters. There's no way that you're going to um, deny polygyny and still be able to fully love all of Yah's wives. You're not going to be able to fully give yourself um, to your, your sister wives. And that means that your love is based on conditions when you refuse to accept it. Well, I'll love you if. I'll love you if you behave this way, if you laugh this way, if you flatter me this way, if you say this. And that is not love at all. And I, I believe that when you get to that place that you've truly deceived yourself into thinking that you have love, but you really have not at all. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. Let the Most High be your Yah and grant you fruit when you meet his conditions. Hallelujah. Let him let him bring you to a place you didn't know existed. Seriously. If you really love the Most High, all things are possible. All right, next question. Next question. Is it inappropriate to offer suggestions of improvement to your master concerning finances? Sister Ashley. That's a, that's a loaded gun, huh? So <laughs> is he asking your advice? Is he needing it? Is he messing up and you see it and you want to be contentious? Are you even able to um, judge your own intentions? You know, are you able to support him even if he falls? Are you able to love him even if he collapses, even if all things, you know, worst case scenario, you start to ask yourself these things. Uh, we can go a lot of different directions, but you go ahead, Mother Jennifer. I think it's, it's very good that, you know, you brought up the point, what is your intention? Because a, a, a lot of times we ask questions, but we really have to ask ourselves first and foremost, what is my intent behind asking this question? You know, what What really is my motive? Is my motive pure or am I asking because there was a situation that came up that I don't agree with and so I want to insert my two cents, but he has not asked me. Um, a lot of times women will find themselves in situations where they have talked so much, they have been so contentious that your, your husband will not even allow you to give him advice because you've been so contentious in the past. So in that case, you may need to just be content and be quiet. And like Sister Ashley said, will you support him if you, if he fails, if you both fail because of a decision that he's made? Will you support him? You know, will you continue to to be a comfort to him? Will you or will you just crumble? And will you say, I told you so? So will you allow your lifestyle to really minister to him and not your words? Sister Ashley? Yes. Do you ever encourage him with your words? Do you ever say, I support your decision? You know, um, if it's if he's allowed you to make financial decisions, you know, hey, here's some money, go to the store, get what we need, then that's the changes that you can make. That's the penny pension or the saving that you can make. That's where you can store up some things if he allows. 
you know, so the things that are within your area, the liberty that he's given you, the capability that he's given you, that's what you can navigate because he supports you, has faith in what you're doing, what he's allowing you to do. Um, but to get into what he's doing, uh, no, ma'am. I wouldn't, just with the, the question that's been asked and no other details, I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow you or it's not that I allow anything, but, you know, to, to encourage you to do that. Um, you'll learn a lot more life lessons by remaining silent than you ever would by speaking. And I've always said those who talk more repent more. Um, and you can you can really sit back, assess things, um, assess your fears. You know, you're afraid of losing money. You're afraid of losing your house. You're afraid of your lights going off. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with your own fears. Fear always motivates a woman to control. Um, I, I think that gives you enough to, to think on. Next question. Next question. How do you perform deliverance on children who do not understand how spirits operate? Or what is the appropriate age to perform deliverance on your children? And how do you discern between a discipline issue or a spiritual issue? This is a loaded question. I'm going to read it one more time. How do you perform deliverance on children who do not understand how spirits operate? Or what is the appropriate age to perform deliverance on your children? And how do you discern between a discipline issue or a spiritual issue? Sister Ashley? All right, so performing deliverance, we don't recommend a lot of people to do anyway. And when you commit to performing deliverance on someone who doesn't understand, we're all children. We're all children, right? Would I perform deliverance on a 35-year-old woman who doesn't understand what's about to happen? You know? Um, so, you know, not not knowing the details, I would just... I would just um, I would suggest you, you know, you stay on your knees with your, about your child. I said that I suggest you keep your ear open to what what wisdom may say. You know, let wisdom have her perfect work. And patience have her perfect work. All those things that the father can place in your home, um, and let him really, really direct you, direct um, your husband. As far as performing deliverance on all children, it depends if you have, you know, um, a child who's old enough to turn from a rebellious way, or maybe you have children small enough that are learning how to even walk in a way. Either way, we're all teaching our children to deny evil, but every man's house has different rules. I teach mine to obey their father's house. We all teach our children to know the difference between good and evil, so if our children are to know the difference between good and evil, they're also born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So depending on the age of your child, you don't need to have manifest any impatience with them. You teach them to honor their father, whether he's a believer or not. Are they tormented? Are they old enough to know something's tormenting them? Do they trust you and your behavior to come to you for help? Are you forcing it on them? If they are tormented, do they know it? And do you or have you taught them how to end a behavior that they're in? Have you practiced teaching the same principle over and over, trying to attain a result? Then if they can't change, if they can't stop the torment, or they don't stop the torment, then what does your husband say? Definitely, as a mother, don't take it personal when your child is misunderstanding deliverance, your child is, um, you know, making wrong decisions, but, you know, depending on um, their age. But you're not to take it personal and to lay that weight upon yourself and say they're doing it because of me. But at the same time, how much of you are they manifesting? How much should you rep repent on their behalf because of what you've put in them? Uh, you're not to, Colossians 3.21, uh, Mother Jennifer, please. And when I say don't take it personal, um, mothers will get frustrated, angry, you know, uh, contentious or 
very verbal, verbally abusive. Um, curse their children, and we, the, you know, English English says curse, but profanity use profanity to their children because you took it personal that they didn't do what you said to do. You gave them instructions, they didn't do it. Maybe you do have a child that's not listening because you said it. Well, nine times out of ten, they're just making their own decision because it just flat out is what it is. They wouldn't care who said it. So don't take it personal. You are to handle them. Have you rotted that child? Have you ever practiced the first base foundation of training a child, which is rod? Did you spare the rod? You know, there's a lot of questions that I would ask uh, before you can give precise or concrete answers. Colossians 3.21, Mother. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. To be discouraged is to be disheartened. And another translation says to be spiritless. You can literally provoke them to so much anger, pushing them over the edge that they would be spiritless. Not even knowing who to be. You know? The the great thing about children, as the Father has told us, to become as little children, the great thing about children is how quick they forgive. So with the mistakes you've made and that what they've seen you do and how much they may be acting out of character because you have put it in them or taught them, etc., they will forgive. They forgive easy. Their love is... Um, very unconditional. To this day, don't each of you still love your mom and your dad? Regardless of what they've done, and some of you have some really, really terrible things that have happened, right? But your heart still desires that love. And your child's the same way. They'll forgive you. They'll watch you grow. Grow together. Take it slow. Not that I um, am teaching Mother Jennifer to not be aggressive towards getting your child free from something. We've we've taken all kinds of scenarios, children that are uh, throwing things into walls, busting holes in walls, eating swine because they want to, and their mother and father's house when they say no. I mean, every kind of rebellious attitude. But if you have a child that's learning to walk in the ways of the Most High Yah, learn with them. Let it be um, not a friendship, but um, just a lesson, a life lesson together. Yah will show you and speak through your husband, if you trust him, to guide and direct the house. Yah will show you, show you everything. Mother Jennifer? Sister Ashley, I think you brought up a really good point when you said how much of you are they manifesting. And I think a lot of times um, as mothers, we tend to forget that we're the first-line teachers, so they're going to learn from us. So the behaviors that they're manifesting could be because of what they see in us. And when you as a mother have uh, truly done what you need to do, you see that behavior in your child, and you know that, okay, this is, um, say, laziness operating in me. And this child sees laziness in me, so this child is lazy because of that. So you make up in your mind to not be lazy. Give that child an example to follow. You know, don't be slack. Don't be slothful. Give them um, uh, things that they need to do every day. Take them with you to do the chores every day. Uh, Make sure it's done right. And then you'll be able to operate in in such um, more sound wisdom when dealing with that particular spirit that you see in them because you know that you're not going to tolerate it in yourself. But there's so many times that we tolerate spirits within ourselves and then we see it in our children and we want to discipline our children, but we haven't dealt with ourselves first and foremost. Sister Ashley? Hallelujah. So you want them free, obviously, as a mom, and that's what's driving your care and your compassion. But you can begin to operate in the flesh if you control them or if you're negative or angry. If you get into your flesh, it's uh, you've gone down the wrong path. So when you want them free, you pray and you wait. You pray and you wait. You take things patiently. We don't got to end this right now. I mean, you're on your own journey to get free from what is binding you. Can you do it right now? Can you set yourself free from, you know, your thoughts, your torments right now? No. 
And um, I don't know if this will encourage anybody. You know, I'm I, I'm a homeschool teacher, as most of you or many of you, and um, I have my oldest son, who's seven in third grade, um, very quick-minded, catches on, makes teaching super easy. Um, you teach him one time, he's got it. We move on. Honestly, you repeat it, you go back, he's got it. It's just it's just there. Um, but what happens when it's time for writing and you don't like writing? Well, I'll just take my time and, you know, look around and, uh, you know, not be focused. And, oh, timer goes off. You had 40 minutes for your writing and what? You're on how, how far? Right? Or if I check on you 10 minutes in or halfway in, what? You know, I'm, I'm saying, a, a, you know, inside communication. And it's time after time after time. Okay, let's use a scenario and go, man, is this a discipline issue or is this a spiritual issue? Hmm, man. Well, I haven't done either. So let's try it. That which is natural first or or spiritual first. You always go to prayer. But I go to, go to uh, Deacon, his father, right? Hey, this is what I got going on. This is he's not finished. Okay. So I want to update every day. All right. So day after day after day, four days later, still? Still not focused on it? Okay. So fill in the blank. If you're a biblical home, you know what happens. So then what happens? We don't just give up there, right? So then Deacon stops by um, every day during school hours, homeschool to check in. Gentle knock on the door, you know, face in the window, I open up, how's he doing? Everything's on time. Everything. Writing. You got eleven minutes on his timer left. And he's turning it in. Oh, was it a spirit? Or was it a discipline issue? I don't know, but the rod took care of it. My husband always taught me from the beginning, the rod is deliverance. The rod is the father's deliverance for you. The rod is delivered. You skip the rod and you jump straight to deliverance? You want to cast everything out and you haven't done the first thing? No balance. Well, how old do we start? And how old? My child is six months old. I thump him on the cheek. Call somebody if, if you got an issue. Call Deacon Bell if you got an issue. You thump him on the cheek. They don't like it. Does that mean everybody needs to thump their child? And say, no. No, you just begin to give them a a response. Are you going to do this? I'm going to react. All right, you're going to respond this way? I'm going to react. So you, you start early. So what age do we stop giving the ride? What, hey, ask your husband. And we never have or he doesn't allow it. Okay, stay on your knees. You don't allow it, so don't, don't pull your hair out because he doesn't allow it. Learn the ways of the Father for your house, by your obedience. Hallelujah. I think that's enough on that, Mother Jennifer. Anything else from you? No, Sister Ashley, I think you covered it really well. I don't have anything else. Um, I think we can go on to the next question. Are you ready? One verse, Mother Jennifer, comes to mind in Judith. It's, it's, um, it's chapter 8, verse 14. It says, you cannot find the depths of the heart of man. So you can't even find the depths of the heart of your own child. You can't. You can't. I'm not saying stop searching, just you can't. All right? Just do your role, be the best at it, and be at peace. All right, next one. Hallelujah. Okay, next question. Expound on why Yah commanded all men to come before him during the feast. Are women not permitted to attend? Sister Ashley? All right, real quick. I'm not going to say real quick. Let's spend, let's spend a moment on this. I don't think um, this is a great, um, great, great question for our brethren or our pastor, too, but I'm going to give you what I've learned. Okay, I'm going to give you what I've learned from them. Um, uh, Mother Jennifer, you are a woman. Is that correct? Absolutely. You ever been allowed to a feast? Yes, Absolutely. To the uh, audience in there, you ever been allowed to feast women? Yes. Yes. Okay. So are they allowed? Yes. Let's get some understanding because there's a motive to your question. There's an intent to your question. And to those who are learned, they understand. 
potentially new and don't understand why there's such a distinct difference between male and female. All right, I'm going to pull up my uh, my e-sword, electronic sword, so I can go through a few things really quick. I'm going to go to Exodus. Let's see. I'm trying to go to Exodus. What's going on here? All right. Y'all give me a second. Exodus, we're going to go to chapter 35, if it will, and it won't. What's going on with my Bible? Uh, go to 35, verse 22, please, Mother Mother Jennifer. e is uh, froze up on me. I think it's verse okay. 22. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Verse 22. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered offered an offering of gold unto Yahweh. All right, so they all came, but men offered. Y'all catch that? So when you look behind a few words here, you're going to find that the builder of the family name, the son, is who Yah is speaking to. Why? Because in our culture, if the man comes, who else is coming? Or if the man lives by law, who else is following? So when it's talking to a man, it's all encompassing. It's getting a message directly to a man so that he will also be the priest of his house. So there were offerings made by fire, and there were sin offerings, and meat offerings, and voluntary offerings, and sacrifice offerings, and peace offerings, all kinds of offerings from our people. You'll never find a verse that says women offering. Never. Y'all go with me for a moment, okay? Let's go to Numbers 1525. And I wish this would work so that I can even see my own thoughts here. There we go. I got it, Mother Jennifer. Hold tight with me, okay? It says, And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel. Stop. The priest. The priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation. Who's the priest? He's a officiating leader. He's an acting priest. He's a chief ruler. He's a principal officer. He's a man. Okay, so a woman is never a priest. So there were limitations on women from the beginning. Okay, now let's go to Leviticus 23. Verse 1. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of Yah. And he goes on and on. Concerning the feast, Moshe was to speak to the children of Israel. Who was the children that he was speaking to? Your mind, your American mind might say, oh, that's men, women, children. If you, It's the son, the builder of the family name. Moshe is speaking to the men that the people would come the holy convocation and the feast. The speech was given to the men that the people would follow. All right? Now, we brought up a uh, priest. And you might say, well, my mama was a, uh, my mama was a, a pastor or a priest. Who are the priests? Let's give an example. Exodus 28.1. Exodus is actually the book that is not working for me tonight on Esau, strangely. So, if you don't mind, Mother Jennifer, Exodus 28.1. And take thou to. unto thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. I didn't hear no Jennifer, no Carol, no ne- Nalita. No summer, no, I didn't hear no women's names, right? Okay, so then Exodus 29 actually tells tells you what the priest was to do and what they were, you know, literally to the detail on the offering. You know, cut this, burn that, do this. I mean, very detailed instruction for the priest. Where are the women at? Well, they ain't in that chapter. That's for sure. But that's for our people. You see how you think? This is our people. It's not about me or you or her or him or this. It's us. The priests are doing this for us. 
I'm not going in the tabernacle as a woman and offering up no offering. The priests were men. It's no different from the commandments, right? Were the commandments male only? Were they? Are the men to obey the commandments and the women do whatever they desire? But yet an offense enters when all males shall appear before Yah three times. Exodus twenty three fourteen, Mother Jennifer. That's where that's where this comes up. Pull it up for me. Like I said, I don't got Exodus. I need it, but don't Exodus got it. Exodus twenty three. Oh. Fourteen. You ready? 14. Yes. Fourteen. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. What are you KJV? I am, yes. Keep, okay, go one up and one give me two or three verses. Okay. I'm gonna start at thirteen and I'll go to fifteen. And in okay. all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods. Neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of Abib. For in it thou camest out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. Hallelujah. Thank you. So I don't have my word search. Um, Sakina, you can find it and post it later. But there's a verse that says, three times in a year shall all males appear. It might be Leviticus 23. I thought Exodus 23. Either way, the three times are unleavened bread, the feast of harvest, which we call also the feast of first fruits, and then the feast of ingathering, which is the harvest at the very end of the year, which is tabernacles. And you can find that in Leviticus 23 as well. So it says that all males shall appear. And this actually comes up very often when women come to the faith because there is so much of a deep hurt and rejection that they are blaming the Most High for that they can't understand his uh, distinctions uh, in between his roles and his offices, you know. And what you got? Deuteronomy 16, 16. Thank you. So I don't want to spend too much time on it or to confuse anybody because we really don't get into a lot of doctrines on this show. We are just women, and we speak a lot about behavior and, and nature. But if you can see um, what I mean by or where I'm going, where I'm going, where Moshe is speaking unto the children, okay, he's speaking mainly and only to the sons, the builder of the family name that all will follow. Women and men were to offer up things for their sins. But women did not function in a priest role. They were not a chief ruler or officiating priest, right? So that limited them. Zechariah 8 says, Ten men shall take a hold of the, the skirt of a Yahudim, right? And you look behind the, those ten, it's it's male only, if, if um, my translations are, are correct. So there are times where it's men only. You need to learn your Yah. You need to learn your Yah. Yes, you benefit by attending. Yes, you benefit by a patriarchal father. We would not have the word we have nor the the option to be holy, the choice to be holy without men. We would be cast off and forsaken without men. That's his order. So Ephesians 5.2, let me see if I'm right. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. That's your charge. And has given himself for us as an offering. He's now our offering. He's a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. He's our offering. Christ is our offering. All right? Hebrews 10, 5. Let me go there. Thank you all for your patience while you sort through some of these questions. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice an offering thou would not, but a body has you prepared for me, speaking once again of Christ. A body you prepared for me. Christ became so much for us, and a lot of people do away with thoughts and intentions, laws, regulations throughout the years because when Christ changed or came, a lot changed. 
but it didn't remove a woman from her role. It didn't give us um, authority over a man. It gave us a sacrifice that even the more so we would be in our roles, that we would glorify the Father that, yes, I can come to a feast because a male ministry is following y'all's feast. I hope that's easy for you all to understand or at least to say amen if you don't quite understand it. It's a patriarchal order here. There's nothing in our hearts, uh, the righteous women, there's nothing in our hearts that would want it to be any other way. Never would we want to dishonor that. Mother Jennifer? You know, Sister Ashley, I think about um, Miriam in Numbers 12 when um, Miriam spoke against Moses because of the woman that he had chosen, and, and she even questioned, you know, well, um, does Yah not speak with us too? And this can be, uh, if you're not careful, it can lead you into that type of mindset. And you see Yah dealt with Miriam because her mindset was out of order. And so you mentioned rejection, Sister Ashley, and, you know, rejection will cause you to truly act out of order because you don't respect the order that Yah has established from the very beginning. Sister Ashley? Very good. Hallelujah. So the remnant is not man only. The bride is not man only. The virgin is not, uh, the virgin bride that's the reference is not man only. You know, uh, the silver and gold vessels that the Father says uh, some of you are, some of you earth and stone, the vessels for the Father's use is not men only, you know, but all things in respect, all things in order, all things. Hallelujah. So I hope it uh, helps you to understand the intention of your question and really just to dive into the word to understand our creator. I mean, we barely just touched the surface of a of a study that you can give yourself, you know, uh, digging into offerings and sacrifices if you desire, knowing that he now is our sacrifice. I'm not sending you down that journey that you would offer up the same things. But, you know, studying our feast days and our unleavened bread, the feast to harvest, our end gathering, we're actually able to understand the concept of agricultural application in our feast because we are harvesters here. Um, So timing throughout the year is uh, and, you know, Shepard, he, he's said it before, and I, I, I don't have his quotes, but just his mind about reading in the Word and seeing the responsibilities for the men. You know, he's mentioned it before, how um, how impacting it is, you know. Well, we, don't, we don't have the same impact. You read the Word and you know as a woman your role and your behavior and your nature and your submission and your requirements, but you don't have the same uh, responsibilities. So you can't understand. You can't even relate. You can just have compassion and support, you know. But when you're actually, okay, three times in a year shall all males appear. That's pretty much a command. Not pretty much. That's a command, you know. Or the man shall do this and the men do that. And the man, I mean, you can see it all, all throughout uh, the word. You know, it's not a, we're not a woman bashing ministry. We're just a, a, a ministry of order and balance. And thank y'all for it. So if he's um, restoring his feast to you and to your heart and allowing you to come, just know that it's because the men are doing it that you're able to follow. And if he's pulling on your heart to love him and fear him and keep his laws and obey, then that should establish you in his love and prove to you your acceptance even if you were never allowed to a feast. If that were, if that were Yah's law, would you obey? Or would you be offended and rejected? You know, we need to have the heart that says, it wouldn't matter what my father said. I wouldn't let my feeling dictate my obedience. You know, have that kind of heart. Now, when you don't have an answer, like, oh, man, well, I can't find it in the word. Where is it that women can go? Man, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? All right? Well, as you as you look, as you study, as you wait, as you seek him, don't be offended. Because it'll guide your research. And ultimately it'll take you astray. 
you will find the answer you want from the shepherd or false pastor that you want to hear from. They're out there. All right, Mother Jennifer, anything else or next question? Nothing else, Sister Ashley. I think we can move on to the next question. <clears throat> okay, next question says, Will my friendship with sisters that are in polygyny be hypocritical if I am a married woman that is against polygyny? I'm going to read it again. Will my friendship with sisters that are in polygyny be hypocritical if I'm a married woman that is against polygyny? Um, I want to say this, that if there is someone that um, is against polygyny, and if they, you know, if they're actively working on um, their struggles with polygyny, you know, they have questions, uh, I will definitely try to help them. But if there is a woman who is just, um, you know, really stiff-necked and she is, um, she has a stance that she does not want to accept polygyny, that she is just not wanting to change her own opinion regardless of what the word says, regardless of what Yah says, um, I'm going to be careful of spending too much time with that particular woman because I don't want her influence to start influencing me. Um, so there comes a point when you do answer questions, um, you know, you do show love, but you do have to have distance as well. If this woman for years and years you've been trying to, really show her, um, you know, love. You've been trying to show her the, the true righteous example in polygyny, and she is still taking on the same stance and nothing is changing. Um, I don't give that woman too much time personally. Sister Ashley? Wise counsel, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? How can you be a friend and a friend at all times? Um, James says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with Yah? And whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God? So to be a friend of a saint and to be caught up in carnality? From whence come wars and divisions among you? Fightings. Right? Your opinion and hers. And the Apocrypha is full of scriptures about friends. A friend is not known in prosperity when everything's going great. But an enemy can't hide in adversity. And perchance something goes wrong and she needs your help. You'd be the first one to throw a dart at her marriage, at her husband, at her covenant, at her sister wife, because you don't agree, you don't understand. No, you can't be a friend. Mother Jennifer. Very well said. This is Ashley. I don't have anything to add. Um, I think I'm going to move on to the next question. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. I think so. Okay. We got a lot of questions about polygyny tonight. Um, hold on one second. Okay. It says it's a polygynous family, and this is the scenario. The second wife is trying really hard to get along with the first wife, but the first wife is constantly rejecting her. What do you do as the second wife? Um, Sister Ashley, you know, we could answer this just like we would answer um, any other question with a, a sister, if a sister is constantly rejecting you. And I think we answered something similar to this last week when you said you want to make sure it's not your own accusation say, saying that, okay, she's rejecting me. Or you want to make sure it's not your own insecurity that says that she's rejecting you. Um, you know, the word says that love suffers long. So you have to learn how to suffer long. And you have to really learn what it really means to be rejected. Are you, are you really, truly being rejected, or is it something in you that is accusing towards her? Now, if you really are being rejected and you're still um, committed in your heart to suffer long and to show love, then really stay on your knees, you know, really stay on your knees and, and see, is there something that you have done in that relationship 
that has um, has tainted that particular relationship because of what you've done, something that you need to get right. Um, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your heart is clear and that your mind is clear and that you have done nothing wrong, then love suffers long. You continue to love and you let Yah be your advocate. Um, I want to say this, that, you know, the the men in, there, there are very strong men in these polygynous families, and the men are very wise, and they're able to discern everything that's going on without you even telling them. So the man will step in and deal with things as he sees them, if it is needed. So um, he doesn't need you always constantly running in his ear, you know, talking about, oh, I feel rejected, um, you know, I, I feel this, I feel that. He doesn't need that. You just have to be mature and make sure that you haven't done anything um, to offend. And if you have, that you have done what you can to get it right. Sister Ashley? Absolutely. Um, praise Yah for the truth of polygyny and the fire that brings perfection. Um, let all things be done decently and in order. You apply that personally, my sisters, personally. So personally, I, I fear that you haven't found out how personal it is yet. Let all things that you do to anyone be done decently and in order. You shall never reward evil for evil. Let all your things be done with charity. All things. I love an old message called Ten Shekels in a Shirt. He declares, shall the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering? Shall the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering? Meditate on that. If I'm, I'm going to say if you really are suffering, striving to do things right, can you not bear this patiently as a child of the Most High Yah and say, I'll do it for you? I'll do it for you, Yah. I'll love when I'm not loved. I'll love when I'm rejected. I'll do all things with charity. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us must receive the things that are done in our bodies. And according to what you have done, whether it be good or bad, you shall receive. And when you walk in fear of those things, it will chart your nature. I simply cannot reward someone with accusation, attacks, anger, gossip, slander, just because it's being done, or whatever your case is, whatever you think it is. Sometimes it's perceived. Sometimes it's your own accusations. But worst case scenario, if you're chosen for this lot to to receive any form of suffering, and no, polygyny does not have to be suffering. I'm just speaking as as uh, Mother Jennifer says. We just try to help each person in their uh, with their nature, you know, but suffer. Suffer long. Suffer to the end. Love to the end. Learn what Christ had to endure. With the people that didn't love him. With the people that said one thing on their lips and did other things behind his back. We're called, according to his purpose, for these things. And that's what you may never get. That's what you may never, that's what a haughty woman will never, ever put up with. Sometimes I I would counsel in the in, maybe in the smallest I say counsel but just something it's just conversation sometimes and somebody may say you know what do you do when this you know because everyone feels like at some point you've been done wrong every one of you whether it's by your husband because he's taking on someone else or by your husband because he's thinking or by pastor because he's telling people to take on more wives or by this woman because she cut her eyes at me, or this one said, every, everybody believes, don't we Americans? Don't we believe that so much has been done to us? Your strength is small. And often we give somebody in conversation the, the, the smallest thing to do, and they can't. 
in their heart and with their eyes and their countenance, you can see that they can't even perform the very work of love that's required to be accepted before Yah. I'm not saying that what you're going to do is going to be accepted by any sister because she has her own fight and her own struggle and her own voices to overcome. I'm saying you want to be accepted by Yah, you need to obtain this nature and get there and get there quick as you can. Hallelujah. Mother Jennifer? You know, Sister Ashley, I, I believe, um, you know, when you think about the differences between men and women, um, and you look at the way um, how the, the men are able to get along so well, and um, when you look at the women, um, the difference is, is one of the differences, I believe, is that the women are very sensitive. Um, the women take things very personally. And, you know, the word tells us that our confidence should be in the fear of Yah. So in the fear of Yah, that's where your strong confidence lies. You truly have a pure, um, true relationship with him, then you're going to have confidence. But that confidence is not going to be in you or it's not going to be in the fact that someone else accepts you or someone else is using flattering words uh, to approve of you. It, your confidence is going to be in the fear of him, the fact that you fear him. And it's not going to matter um, what they display because you're not going to take it personally. You're not going to be overly sensitive. Sister Ashley? Very well. I've met very, very few women, very few women, that are actually able to love more than they're hated. Next question. That is it for the questions. I believe we have one testimony, though. She's waiting to call in. Um, do you want to take that testimony now? Hallelujah. Why not? What we got? What time is it? Let's see. All right, 736. We got some time. Sure. All right, we will give her time to, to call in then. I think she's going to go now to do that. All right, so I'm looking for a uh, a phone call, right? I'm looking for it popping up. Not She's not coming to your phone, right, in your home? She's borrowing a phone, so I'm not sure which um, area code she'll be calling from. Okay, all right. I have a, I have an anonymous question um, that was given to me, so maybe maybe I can... Go that way. I don't want to keep her too too long on hold either. The question is, uh, what are some helpful biblical references uh, to pray for a spouse that is turned from his first love? Um, not knowing um, the situation or or you know who it is and what's going on, um, I would assume that she means a man who's turned from the Most High, meaning he at one time served Yah or loved Yah. Um, Deuteronomy, I, I love that Varim, Deuteronomy, and it says, um, they will turn, speaking of women, they will turn away the son from following me, that they will serve other gods, so that the anger of Yah will be kindled against them and destroy you suddenly. All right, so just keying in on turning away, turning away. And after the turn away, the anger of Yah will be kindled against and destroy them suddenly. So there has to be a lot of fear in asking this question. You have a spouse that you've seen their heart turn. That's very delicate. And it says, thus shall ye deal with them. All right, and this was when the Most High in Deuteronomy chapter 7 was... Um, given instruction, he said, Thus shall you deal with them, ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images. He's speaking specifically to the men in action to cut down their groves, burn their graven images, for you are a holy people unto Yah. I hope that you can pick up, sisters, the zealousness that um, Yah expected in his people against those who were against him. He says, You're chosen and special above all people that are on the face of the earth. In Deuteronomy 11, 16, it says, Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived and that you turn aside and you serve other gods and you worship them. All right? So you take heed to yourself that your heart is not deceived. All right? And it's written because it's possible, it's able, it could happen, it's going to happen, whatever, right? Deuteronomy 4, 
says, let me find my verse, 27, Yah, the Lord, shall scatter you, that's all of us, okay, but previously, years, generations prior, Yah shall scatter you among the nations, ye shall be left very few in number among the heathen, there you will serve gods, the work of men's hand, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell, but if you from then shall seek Yah and find him, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, when you are in tribulation, keyword, because that's a circumstance for the scattering or the turning that has happened. When you are in tribulation and all these things are come upon you, and even in the latter days, which is now, if you turn to Yahweh your Elohim and shall be obedient unto his voice, he will not forsake you. He will not destroy you. He will not forget the covenant of your fathers. That's a good promise that you're taking to the father about your husband you or his spouse. You cannot turn his heart. Right? So I, uh, and I'm sure you know that. So you're stepping back. You're saying, I can't control. I can't turn him. But you can. You can turn him. Because what? It, you said when this tribulation comes upon you, in the latter days, what would happen if he turned back to you, then he would obey, you would never forsake him, you never destroy him. All right, just two more, and I'll go, I'll go to the call. But in uh, Deuteronomy 30, uh, this is a good question even for, uh, for the show. I don't think we've ever talked about this. It's a very personal question. I appreciate it. Um, Deuteronomy 30, and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse. Remember, this is for repentance or forgiveness right here. Okay? It, it, so something's going to come upon you if you turn from the Father, period. That's what you're not going to protect your spouse from. And that's the impact that you have in your spirit because you don't know what's going to happen. That's, the, that's where Yah becomes your Yah and fear becomes real. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I've set before you, and you will call upon them to mind among all the nations, whether Yah has driven you. Listen, it says, and you shall return unto Yahweh and shall obey his voice according to all that I command you, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Yah will turn your captivity, have compassion on you, and will return and gather you from all the nations. So there's promises for a turning. And I guess that's where, you know, um, unless I was just with my Bible at home and, and trying to go a different direction, I guess that's what really just comes up in my heart with the question initially is that, you know, your your prayers, you're not going to find in there really how to pray to get anybody to turn. You know that there's a circumstance and a payment for someone turning, period. And your prayers would be with hope. Because if you didn't have hope, you would have shame. If you didn't have hope, you would have condemnation. You know, if you didn't have hope, you would be swallowed up in sorrow. So if you have sincere hope, i got one more. I'm going to go to First Kings. Let me find it. Um, thank you all for waiting while I flip through tonight. We don't always share so many uh, scriptures, but it just is how it is tonight. First Kings 6. Verse 12 says, concerning uh, this house, he was talking to Solomon. I really like this chapter. Solomon's building the temple. He's talking, uh, Yah is literally dealing with Solomon straight up and saying, concerning this house which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you. Verse 13, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people. And you know, each of you know, he's going to dwell amongst his children, Israel, that's it, and not forsake his people, that's it. And we really don't know who is his until actions are made, vows are made, footsteps are made, you know. So keep your fear, reminding the Father of his promises for those that are his and that if they turn. So you would kind of gather your, your spiritual warfare prayers based around that word turn because you're praying for the turning point. You're not saying, oh, do whatever it takes to get them to turn, you know, and that's probably your fear that you're facing anyway. 
You know, how do you even word this? I don't even take this to the Father. You're saying, whatever you do, let your blessing and your and your you know promises fall on him when he turns. Hallelujah. Let me go over to uh, the phone lines. Mother Jennifer, anything from you? No, Sister Ashley, I think you covered it very well. Um, and we are looking for area code 706, I believe. All right. Hallelujah. It is there. Thank you for holding. Thank you for calling. Who are we speaking to? Area code 706, you are live. Bless you. This is Crystal Bryant from Straightway, Florida. Shalom. You are loud and clear. Thanks for taking some time out and listening and calling in. Sister Crystal, what you got? Share something. Thank y'all. First of all, bless you, Sister Ashley, and bless you, Mother Jennifer. Um, I pray that everything comes across very clear because I am a little nervous, um, (laughs) but um, just to be talking on this platform, but I'm not going to let that get in my way. I wanted to share a testimony um, first off about what happened at the Dry Bones Conference in Jacksonville and then the Dry Bones Conference in Dallas, Texas. And, um, you know, I, I want to start off by saying I, I heard a lot of people's testimonies and um, talks about how, I should come, how people should come expecting something, and that's something that I didn't know. I was just really excited to see the man of Yah in person, you know, talking to us and, and teaching us and showing us you know, righteousness and being to, uh, being able, I'm sorry, <laughs> being able to um, sit at the feet of, of wise, um, seasoned women, um, mothers, um, sisters who have endured together. So um, I was just really excited. And um, when I went, I, I had um, pastors started praying for, um, people with pain and disease, and this is in Jacksonville, and I started praying with them, and I just begged and cried out to the Father um, to heal me. I had back pain for 10 years, 10 and a half years, um, debilitating back pain. Uh, 99% of the time, my back was hurting, my lower back. Um, I actually was due to have surgery last this past February, um, and didn't end up having it. And um, I also had these knots in the joints of my hands um, for the past year or so. And I couldn't move my hands when I first woke up. They'd be numb. My fingers, my um, my joints would just hurt um, really bad. And I cried out to the Father and I prayed and I could literally feel the pain leaving my body. It was such an incredible feeling. Um, It was an overwhelming joy. And um, I'm just so incredibly thankful for that. And then, um, well, prior to the conference, probably for the past four or five months um, prior, I had learned about the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit in um, with evidence of speaking in tongues. And that's something that was foreign to me. Um, so I had been studying it and seeking the Holy Spirit diligently. And uh, my dear sister, Chrissy, she knew that. And at the conference, literally right after my healing, she turned um, and came to me and she said, don't miss your day of visitation. <laughs> Sorry. Spirit. Now, I was so scared, even though I knew that this was something that y'all had for me. And she walked me to Mama Carol, and um, I received the Holy Spirit. And ever since that day, my life has changed dramatically for the for the good, of course. And it's just been such an amazing journey. I'm I'm a newbie. I'm a baby, but just since then, it's been absolutely amazing. And um coming to Dallas, going to the Dallas conference. Again, I don't know why I I didn't expect anything. I was just so thankful to be around the saints and uh, a couple of days leading up to the Dallas conference. I had a growth um, underneath my tongue 
It was about the size of a dime. It hurt so bad. I, I showed my master. I told him, you know, I, I don't know what it's from. You know, we prayed about it. Um, it hurt to eat. It hurt to talk, to move my tongue, period. It was just painful. And um, during the conference, everything that Pastor was saying, it was like he was a direct line from Yah. Everything that he touched on was things that I was dealing with, and Yah was working through him to talk to me personally. Um, and I'm very thankful that everybody else got healed as well. But during the healing, um, the growth that was underneath my tongue completely went away. And I just, I just wanted to come on here and just give that testimony and just praise Yahuwah and thank him for everything that he's done and possibly be a hope or an encouragement to any of my sisters um, that are out there as well. So um, that's all. And I also want to say thank you to all of the Georgia sisters who encouraged me to come on tonight and talk about my testimony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Brother Hallelujah. Sissy, who shall not fear you, O Yah, and glorify your name, for you only are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your deeds are made manifest. Hallelujah. And you, my sister, were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and spirit, which is Hallelujah. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, it definitely proves our shepherd's obedience, the um, you know, seal of the ministry, us, our, our fruit that follows, signs that follow. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you to anyone who's listened that it, that made an impact with you. You truly may never know um, why you called or needed to or Share. Bless you. Bless you all of Florida. Thank you, Sister Crystal. Bless y'all. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. And uh, Sister A.S. says shalom from Finland. Hallelujah. All the way from Finland. Blessings to Sister uh, Crystal. Well, that's it from me. Uh, sometimes, Mother Jennifer, it's hard to, not hard, challenging to contain Yah in me. Um, you know, my my Thanksgiving my praise, my zeal, you know, it wouldn't profit any of you if I just shouted or or flipped the table over or, or you know, just jumped and made us laugh. I have to really, like, I, I got to really, I don't know that side, you know, you don't know that side of being on the other, you know, I, I have no um, no problem praising, no pride in me that's going to keep me from praising. There's no way these things would be happening without him bearing witness that he's real, he's alive, and he's working in us in us, amongst us, and through us, and deserves our lives, our full surrender and submission. Hallelujah. Mother Jennifer, end the show. Hallelujah. Um, Sister Ashley, you know, I, I just want to quote something that you said that I thought was very profound, and I really want the Daughters of Zion to focus on it. You said, I won't let my feelings dictate my obedience. So we need to move in obedience this week and don't allow your feelings to dictate what you're going to obey and what you're not going to obey. Blessings to you, and that's all I have, Sister Ashley. Amen. 